Welcome to Artworks, the weekly podcast from the National Endowment for the Arts. I'm Josephine Reed. For the next two weeks, we're choosing a couple of best of podcasts to repost. And hands down, the number one show to repost was my interview with drummer, educator, producer, and 2021 NEA Jazz Master, Terry Lynn Carrington. Terry Lynn has been an innovative and dynamic drummer in jazz since the 1980s. She's known for her versatility as a drummer and the ease with which she can play different genres of music while maintaining a foundation in jazz. And we see the same versatility in the many roles she plays throughout music as a composer, band leader, educator, and producer. An advocate for social justice and gender equity, she's the founder and artistic director of the Berkeley Institute of Jazz and Gender Justice. Carrington's also a multiple Grammy Award winner, including a 2014 Grammy for Best Jazz Instrumental Album for Money Jungle, becoming the first woman to win as a leader in this category. Terry Lynn Carrington has accomplished a great deal artistically as well as professionally. And given her age, she enjoys an extraordinary career that people far older would envy. But she started young, playing her first professional gig when she was just 10 years old, with Clark Terry, no less. It helps to have grown up in a house filled with music. My father plays saxophone and drums, and my grandfather was a drummer as well. He passed away about six months before I was born, so it just kind of runs in the blood. Tell me about music in your house. What, what would your family be listening to? What were you listening to when you were growing up? My father played music really loud, so I always joke around that I came out the womb with rhythm. But he played mostly blues-oriented jazz. People like Jimmy McGriff, Jack McDuff, a lot of organ trios, and things that were easy for a young person to grasp. The drums weren't your first instrument, even though you started playing them when you were really, really young. I started playing alto saxophone first, trying to be like my dad, I guess. Uh, Then I switched to the drums when I lost my first set of teeth and started playing drums at seven. Do you remember why the drums, Terry Lynn? What drew you to them? I think I started playing the drums because they were there. I was exposed to them at a young age, and my father had them set up, so I was curious about them. And I think that's really key for any young person to have exposure to things that they may find interesting or that they may be curious about. How influential was your father, not just to your musical style, but your approach to music, the way you thought about music? My father was pretty much my first mentor. Um, He was probably my biggest influence, especially back then. Uh, And of course, I grew to have, you know, my own opinions and, and my own thoughts about music. But even to this day, we agree on a lot because he raised me and he was the person that I tried to be like, I think, in many ways. You played with Clark Terry when you were very young. I think you were 10. Can you tell me about that experience and how that happened? When musicians would come through the Boston area, uh, my father would take me to the clubs to see them, often on Sunday afternoons for the Sunday jam sessions. And because he knew so many people, he would tell them that I played the drums and that I could keep time. You know, I could do something that would warrant them to invite me to sit in with them because I think they either didn't believe him or they just had to hear for themselves. And so Clark was one of those people. And when he heard me, he offered me to go to Wichita, Kansas. And that was my first professional gig at 10 years old where I was a guest with his East Coast, West Coast jazz giants. And that's the first time I ever got paid and flew anywhere. Well, shortly after, I think at the ripe old age of 11, you were given a full scholarship to the Berklee College of Music. And I think that needs some backstory. How did this happen? When I was 11 years old, I went to a festival where Oscar Peterson was playing. Also on the bill was Count Basie and Ella Fitzgerald. Because I met Ella Fitzgerald before, I sat with her on the side of the stage to watch Oscar Peterson play. And when he came off the stage... She grabbed me by the hand and introduced me to him and said, I play drums and that he should hear me. I had played with Clark Terry actually the night before. He couldn't believe that, so he said, this I have to hear, and we started playing. 
the president of the college at the time, Lawrence Burke and his wife Alma were there and they hadn't left the theater yet and they heard me play and offered me a scholarship to the college. So it was actually Oscar Peterson and Ella Fitzgerald that are responsible. Not bad musical godparents. Were you going full time? Were you also going to school? How did, how did this work? I attended Berkeley College of Music when I was 11 years old, part time, until I graduated from high school and then I started going full time. But I went once a week studying piano and drums and taking some ensembles and also uh, studying African percussion with a master percussionist, Pablo Landrum. And basically I could float around to some different classes and check things out until I got there full time. I want to ask you about a couple of your early teachers, mentors, and one of them is Alan Dawson and the other is Jack DeJeanette. I'm curious how they helped you shape your approach to drumming. Alan Dawson was really important to my development, not only because he was my teacher, but he was the teacher to my previous teachers. And I started with Alan around 14. Somehow between the ages of 14 and 16, I can really see the influence that Alan had on my playing. My technique got much better. My musicality got much better. And I think really he polished my raw abilities better than anybody else. And what about Jack DeJeanette? I know he was another important mentor to you. I met Jack DeJeanette when I was about 17. He and his wife Lydia were like surrogate parents to me. And the coolest thing was they opened me up to so many other styles and genres and just ways of looking at things uh, philosophically, uh, musically. And he never sat down and gave me a drum lesson, so to say but he influenced my ideas about music and the direction I wanted to go on the instrument and career-wise. So Jack is probably my biggest influence, especially as a drummer, because the way he played really spoke to me and I had to work hard to find my own voice because I didn't want to just copy him. When did you first move to New York City? I moved to New York when I was 18. What was the music scene like in New York City during that time? When I first got to New York, I, of course, had friends that I had met at Berkeley and people I played with uh, in Boston. So, of course, you gravitate to those people. I met Cassandra Wilson and Steve Coleman, and the movement that formed that's tr attributed to m -Base, uh, those are the people that I started hanging out with and and playing some with. But when I would leave town to go work, those gigs were with people like Clark Terry, uh, Farrell Saunders, people that were from a previous generation. So a lot of my work really came from people that were you know, old enough to be my father or my grandfather. And it took a while, I think, for me to start playing more with people of my own generation. And then at 21, I auditioned for Wayne Shorter's group and miraculously got that job because I wasn't sure how I played at the audition, but Wayne said that he felt safe playing with me, and I'm not sure what that means still to this day, but whatever it was, I was grateful for the opportunity to work with him at such a young age, and he helped to really shape my ideas about music as well and about life. It was a breakthrough moment for me getting the job with Wayne Shorter. Then when I moved to LA in 1989, I got the Arsenio Hall show, and that was another breakthrough in a different way. And I could see you know, a different direction for my career. Well, since you mentioned it, let's talk about the Arsenio Hall show. I was so surprised that you were there for four months. I thought it was much longer. And I would also imagine the Arsenio Hall show would really, really call upon your musical diversity and really would encourage that kind of versatility. In 1989, I got the gig to be the house drummer for the Arsenio Hall show. And those shows really do take a versatile musician on every instrument. And I am at heart and my foundation, you know, is jazz, of course. But I always liked groove music and popular music, too. 
So my love for those other idioms helped me get that job, but I've always considered myself a jazz musician that plays these other things sometimes, opposed to the other way around. I was only on the Arsenio Hall show for four months, but most people think that it was a lot longer than that. People to this day still remember me as the drummer on the Arsenio Hall show, and I'm very proud of that. I had to leave the show because I had an album out and I had to make a choice between supporting the album, which was nominated for a Grammy, or staying on the show. And I was led to believe I could do both, but it didn't work out that way. But I do believe that everything works out the way it's supposed to. Well, let's talk about that album, Real Life Story. Your first album as a leader, released in 1989, you were really young. Can you tell me about that experience? I had a lot of amazing artists on that album. Carlos Santana, Grover Washington Jr., John Schofield, Patrice Russian, Greg Osby, Diane Reeves, Keith Jones, Don Elias, Hiram Bullock. But it was more in the style of the music I was playing at the time with David Sanborn and Wayne Shorter, which was electronic. So it was nominated in the contemporary jazz category. It was a long time then before you released your second album. Done some homework. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> yeah, like almost 20 years. <laughs> well, it was a really long time. And in fact, you went to Europe to bring out your second album. You went to Act Music in 2002. It was 2006 before you got a U.S. label. That's a long time between albums as a leader. I wonder if it wasn't because of your versatility that there was this gap in you bringing out records as a leader because record companies couldn't put you in this little column. Um, you couldn't be in this particular slot of a record label. I think my versatility did not work in my favor as an artist, though it seemed to work in my favor as a drummer. And the phrase that kept coming back is, she's all over the place. And I kept trying to find a focus or a center to make records because it seemed like you need to be in a nice, neat box for labels and for marketing and for the system that uh, puts out music. But gradually, independent music became more and more necessary as streaming happened and labels changed and people were able to control their own destiny a lot better. So. I decided to make an album. It was called Jazz is a Spirit. And I decided to use my frequent flyer miles and pay for the album myself. And, and it ended up being released on Act Music, a European label. But it was at least my return to being uh, an artist or, or a leader. And the important lesson for me there is that once I invested in myself, my career took off again as an artist, as a solo artist. I wonder, Terry Lynn, if you had women who mentored you. We've mentioned Jack DeJeanette, certainly Wayne Shorter, but were there also women who were helping to guide you? Well, there were certainly women that I talked to and got advice from. Bernice Johnson Regan from Sweet Honey in the Rock, Angela Davis, and of course, people that I worked with, like Diane Reeves, Cassandra Wilson, Dee Dee Bridgewater. But there were not very many women instrumentalists that were able to serve as a mentor because there just weren't that many there. There were many women that I played with and talked to and developed with, like Jerry Allen and Ingrid Jensen and Rini Rosness, but they were more peers. There weren't so many women from another generation that could you know, show us the ropes. So uh, my mentors were mostly men, and they understood gender equity back before people were even talking about it. Wayne Shorter always hired a lot of women. Clark Terry, too. I think that it's important to give credit to the older generation musicians that grew up and came through the music in a certain way and recognized that it needed to be different. So they took it upon themselves to really foster talent in young women. I would think having women who were peers to be there with you. I, I just don't think that can be overstated. 
Oh, absolutely not. <laughs> so one of the problems with gender equity is that women end up playing together and helping and encouraging one another because they don't easily have apprentice relationships. They don't have mentoring from people that have made it. And so they end up playing together, which creates you know, these silos, so to say. And then you're pigeonholed you know, as a woman musician. You had said that you had resisted playing with women-only band for a really long time because you didn't want to be, um, you know, put in a box. But then you created the Mosaic Project, which was all women. Right. You brought in a lot of women musicians who you had played with in the past in various projects, and you created one big project, an amazingly successful, wonderful album. What's the backstory there? What made you decide to turn that corner? A lot of people had asked me to do all female projects or play all female festivals. And I shied away from that because I didn't want to be stereotyped or pigeonholed. But at a certain point, I realized I had been playing with a lot of great women instrumentalists and of course vocalists too and I decided to celebrate that on an album called The Mosaic Project and I did it on my own terms and when I was ready and I, th I think that's the key to the success of the project. I wasn't doing it because I wanted attention or because I wanted uh, to bring women's issues to the forefront necessarily. I just wanted to celebrate these amazing women that I had been working with all along. I'm really curious, and this is no dig on any male musician at all that you've played with, but what shifted when you were in a studio with all women or when you were on the stage and it was all women? It took me a long time to recognize any kind of difference playing with all women opposed to playing with all men. And I think that's because I'm very comfortable playing with all men. It felt very natural to me. I was always about just however the music sounds and feels and not thinking about gender at all. And then when I was in this trio with Jerry Allen and Esperanza Spaulding, they started talking about their guard being down and feeling something different. And that made me look at that and acknowledge it in my own way too. I think for me it was probably not feeling like I had to prove anything and that's the biggest difference because musically I don't really hear gender. I don't hear a difference but it's all the other things that you feel you know when you're on stage, when you're off stage, when you're at dinners, all the things that you feel that create trust with people and create an environment that you can really be your authentic self. Well, you mentioned Jerry Allen and Esperanza Spaulding, and I'd love to have you talk about playing with both of them. When I first came to Berkeley to teach in 2005, I was introduced to Esperanza, and there was something about playing with her that felt like some kind of mystic, cosmic circle had been completed. And I think it's that bass drum connection that I hadn't felt with another woman before on the bass. And I did a gig in Israel where I invited Esperanza and Jerry and Tinika Postma to play. And there was something magical about that union. And that became the seed for the Mosaic Project. But after we made that record, Jerry and Esperanza and I formed a trio that was uh, called ACS, Alan Carrington Spaulding Trio. And I think just that like-mindedness that I have with both of them made it very easy to play and easy to, to find those zones that you want to find when you're playing. Uh, with Jerry being from an older generation than Esperanza, there were certain rhythmic phrases and things in the vocabulary that she used that was very natural to me. So we were always connected rhythmically. And with Esperanza, we were connected rhythmically too. It's just different because the way that a bass breaks up the time with the drummer, you have to sort of be like-minded with what you think is hip or not. 
and we never had to have conversations about it like I've had to have with other bass players. We just liked all the same things, and that made it easy to play with both of them. Well, the Mosaic Project won the Grammy Award in 2012 for Best Vocal Album. Congratulations. Thank you. And you followed the Mosaic Project with Money Jungle, Provocative in Blue, which was this radical rendition of the 63 recording by Duke Ellington and Max Roach and Charles Mingus. You know what this question is going to be. What compelled you to do that? I'm so happy to hear you say radical. That's a big compliment. <laughs> because those are radical musicians. <laughs> I think that if you're going to cover an album, you have to do it differently. So when I did Money Jungle Provocative in Blue, I knew that I couldn't do anything that sounded really like the original album. And those are three very strong personalities, very radical musicians. So I wanted to just really bring my own spin to that music. And I heard a lot of interviews and read interviews of Duke Ellington's where he was really about the future and um, not really hanging on to the things of the past, like most jazz musicians. And in fact, he said uh, that his music was freedom of expression and that he had stopped using the word jazz. So when I heard that, I felt like he wouldn't be offended by uh, the arrangements I did on, on his songs. The casting you know, for that album had to be very special too, because it had to be people that understood Duke Ellington and Charles Mingus, but also understood you know, jazz of the times and of the future. And Gerald Clayton was you know, the perfect pianist for that, as well as Christian McBride on bass. In general, I'm curious how you approach things in the studio. When you're in the studio and you're going to record, do you rehearse a lot? Are there a lot of takes? Just tell me how you typically approach recording. For Money Jungle, I didn't have a whole lot of time to do the basic tracking, two days. And I sent all the music to Christian and Gerald early. And they both really practiced it and came to the studio totally prepared, which was great because that's the last thing you want to happen is to get there when you only have two days and people hadn't looked at the music, which does happen. <laughs> so for me, the easiest way to explain to them what I'm hearing is to demo everything as thoroughly as possible. So I played all of the arrangements, um, sequenced them all, and you know took some really bad keyboard solos <laughs> to show where the solos would go some really bad bass solos on MIDI. And I think that um, doing that really at least helps the musicians see my vision and then take it from there. And of course, they can improve upon it, but I do think it's good to show them as much information as possible from the beginning. Well, Money Jungle won the 2014 Grammy for Best Jazz Instrumental Album, and you were the first woman to receive an award for this. And I'm sure you are tired of talking about it, but no other woman has won since you won in 2014. Honestly, I had no idea you were the first and only woman to win this. Were you aware of that when you were nominated that no other woman had won before? I was aware of it when I was nominated because I looked it up. I was the first woman to win a Grammy in the jazz instrumental category. And I was also the first woman to be nominated as a leader. You know, it's kind of bittersweet because as happy as I was to win, I also realized that there was a lot of work to be done in this area. So these victories really um, in inspire me to work harder for gender equity. I think because jazz is such an expression of freedom, it can be difficult to fully realize it and critique it as part of this same system. You know, it's part of the patriarchal system that we're all in. It doesn't exist outside of it any more than anything else does. The idea is, yeah, that it, freedom is something, as far as I knew, that was supposed to be for everybody. We can't continue to have conversations around one set of oppressions and not include the others. 
So we can't continue to speak about race without speaking about gender and vice versa, or we're still supporting the same patriarchal structure, which is the root cause of all of it. And it doesn't make sense to talk about any of those without talking about environmental justice or animal justice, because without a planet, none of these other things will matter anyway. So I think that we have to all become more inclusive with our justice consciousness and our justice struggles because they're really all connected. And that's what I've grown to understand over the last several years. Well, you're responding not just artistically to inequities, you're also responding institutionally. You teach at the Berklee College of Music and you're the founder and artistic director of Berkeley's Institute of Jazz and Gender Justice. Can you tell me what your hope is for this institute and for the students who go through it? A couple of years ago, I founded the Berkeley Institute of Jazz and Gender Justice, and so many stories that I heard from young women was that they didn't feel comfortable in their ensembles. They didn't feel comfortable trying things because they felt ridiculed or criticized by either their teacher, especially in high school, or uh, their peers. So I felt like that was the reason to start the Institute, so that there was a place where they didn't have to feel those things. I do think we're moving in the right direction. I do think recent times have made people even more conscious and more aware of issues of inequity with race and gender. Over the last five years or so, I've really seen more change and more hope for a better future in regard to gender equity. I've seen it not just at Berkeley, but also at other institutions that I've visited. And it seems that people have finally gotten the message that we need to make these kinds of shifts in order for the music to fully develop. There are more women students. There are more women teachers. And there are more male students and male teachers that are concerned with this issue. And that's the most important thing to me because nothing will really change if women are the ones advocating for women. And it really needs to be uh, across the board. We all have to advocate for each other. Well, that leads me right into your recent album with Social Science, which is Waiting Game. That was nominated for a Grammy Award. And Waiting Game explicitly deals with themes of social justice. It is an extraordinary synergy of musical language. I want to hear the backstory of Waiting Game and your work with social science with Matthew Stevenson and Aaron Parks. Both Matthew Stevenson and Aaron Parks would tour with me in different projects, and I started to really enjoy the conversations that we got into involving issues and problems that we feel affect us as just human beings in the world, but also as Americans. So we got together and started writing some music and we got a gig, then we had to round off the band and we pulled in Morgan Guerin and then Debo Ray and then Casa Overall. And once the band was formed, after about two years, we went in the studio and started cutting the album, which took almost another two years. So it's been a long process, but I'm very pleased with the results because I think we were thoughtful with how we wanted to present this music. Most of the writing is between Aaron and Matthew and myself, and we have a lot of guest artists as well that contributed spoken word and rap. The idea was for it to be a multi-generational band, a multi-ethnic band, people from different walks of life, you know, coming together, different cultural experiences, coming together in unity about these causes. And I think we've seen uh, this past year that that's really what it takes uh, for a change to happen. The composition of Waiting Game is so interesting because the first and second half are very, very different. The first half of the album is very focused, very produced, very poignant in its lyrical content about injustice. And then the second half, 
Esperanza Spalding joins in, and it's extended improvised music. And Aaron Park said, which I really loved, he said he thought the improvised music demonstrates the democracy in action that people are singing about and wanting and demanding in the first part of the album. Yes, he did say that. He said it great. But when, how, why did you get the idea of doing an album that's a combination of these two parts? For me, it's just ideas come. I'm grateful when they come. They just come and there's a spark. And that's the creative spark, I think, that happens. We came into the studio and we were cutting the other tracks and it just so happened that Esperanza was here uh, because it was a snowstorm and she was staying at my house and she wasn't even supposed to be here and she just came to hang out for the day and I said let's just go improvise for an hour without stopping turn off the lights and not do a second take <laughs> and uh, that's what happened we only got to about 42 minutes because nobody was looking at a watch but uh, that ended up being enough time that was one take oh yeah Holy moly, I was going to ask you that. That's amazing. What does instrumental music allow you to do that vocal music doesn't? And conversely, what do the vocals give you perhaps more explicitly than the instrumental part? That's a great question. In general, I think instrumental music challenges your imagination. You can get hints about a theme and it can feel explicit in some instrumental music and in others you have no idea what the composer is trying to say but the biggest and most important thing is that it challenges your imagination and i think as artists that's our job to help you see a, a different future to imagine something that's not there in your memory or ideas with vocal music it's more storytelling, I think. It's inviting you into a, a scene that the artist wants to share with you. Because of the lyrics, you know, the story is obvious and it's, it's right there. And I love both equally. You've also produced albums, and I'm thinking most specifically about Diane Reeves' Beautiful Life, which won a Grammy. I'm curious how you approach producing. It's a very different hat to wear. I think drummers make natural producers. So many of the drummers I know are used to being the leader or the de facto leader of a band because we control so many things, the dynamics, the tempo, the forward motion, if the piece feels relaxed or if it feels intense. There's so many things that we're controlling. So I think that is a good foundation for producing music. It's just a place that I love to be, creating something from nothing, and so different from live performance. If I were to compare it to filmmaking, you know, I feel like a director. What does being named a 2021 NEA Jazz Master mean to you? I was quite surprised and shocked to get that call to let me know that I was an NEA Jazz Master this year. And at first, I think I thought, am I too young for this? But when I looked at you know my career of over 40 years, I felt like, you know, I, I can't help it that I started early. And, you know, I had to just feel good about it myself. And, and I felt grateful that the NEA and the committee felt me worthy. And the biggest thing I feel is it furthering my dedication to keep doing the work that I'm doing. Because, you know, you can't be an NEA Jazz Master and, um, and slack off. <laughs> it makes me work harder and not less. Well, even though you are young, you think a lot about your legacy. Yeah. I'd like to know, at this moment in time, what you would like your legacy to be. Everything that we do is contributing one way or another to a legacy. I think creating value with all that we do is what's important. And when I realized that, my work started changing. And when I decided not to take gigs for financial reasons or thinking just about you know myself, 
when I needed to look at a bigger picture as a decision for the work that I took, um, I realized that everything changed and the universe was supporting my desire to create value in the world, to be mission oriented, to do my part in having a society that I want to live in, to be connected to humanity in a, in a way that makes a difference. So when I think about legacy, I'm thinking really about the present moment because that's all we have anyway. And I need to do everything I can in the present moment that will eventually uh, make a worthy legacy. I think that's a great place to leave it, Terry Lynn. Thank you. And again, many congratulations on being named a 2021 NEA Jazz Master. Thank you. This has been great. Thanks for doing uh, so much homework. Oh, it was my pleasure, truly. Thank you. That was 2021 NEA Jazz Master, drummer, producer, and educator, Terry Lynn Carrington. And the 2022 class of Jazz Masters has been announced. They are Stanley Clark, Billy Hart, Cassandra Wilson, and Donald Harrison Jr. We'll be celebrating them in a concert on Thursday, March 31st, 2022, held in collaboration with and produced by SF Jazz. It will be free and open to the public and also streamed live. So keep checking arts.gov for details. You've been listening to Artworks, produced at the National Endowment for the Arts. I'm Josephine Reed. Stay safe and thanks for listening.